Everyone out there? Soren, you know who you are. You're up, my man. We got him coming in. Matt's coming up. I got a picture of Travis. I think he's going to zoom in. You guys know Travis from the, the days. Uh, Trav calls me. He was snowed in. He's uh, the 11 kids, seven grandkids, and we were talking. What's happening, man? How are you, my man? Good seeing you. Look at my new, look at my new axle. Looking good. Looking good. I'll get back to Travis. How you doing, boys? Hi. Nice seeing you. I talked to Travis, and you guys remember those who came to some of the original proms, as Andy would call it. Travis was serving that uh, tractor soda out of those igloos, coolers. Him and his kids with the Dixie cups. I thought it tasted horrible at first. And I told Travis that. So you guys know now they're being sold in all the Chipotles. And several other, I talked to Travis on the phone. They sold 90 million beverages last year. On track, they're hoping to double. 200 and some, 250. I talked at one time, they were talking like a $2 billion valuation at some point coming down the road with other companies looking at it. But crazy, crazy numbers from a guy that was Dixie cupping it out of those coolers. You guys remember, I know I've seen some faces in the crowd probably seven, eight years ago, but I thought it was just awesome. So great success story. I love his family. I think it's a, it, it done a heck of a job, a bang up job in agriculture. So I'm going to kick things off with Carter. We got Carter on the phone, Carter Williams uh, on Zoom, CEO of iSelect. Carter, kind of give us a little lay of the land, buddy. I, I wish you could have been here, but how's yeah, the wife? I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, it's all right. I couldn't be there. My wife got COVID right there at the uh, on Monday, so I got sort of shut down. But building on Kevin's point, uh, we started investing in 2014. There were 15. Each quarter, there were about 15 deals done in 2015. I think at the mid-course of 2021, during the pandemic, there were about 150. 160 financings in ag tech per quarter. So as a measure of what's going on investing wise, things are growing rapidly. And the, the way we really look at the world right now is we spend about 1.7 trillion in the United States on food. We spend 1.9 trillion on the healthcare costs related to poor nutrition, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, CNS. And so that is a $3.6 trillion market where people are worried about their health, worried about their nutrition, and there are huge opportunities to take share, for food to take market share from the healthcare industry. When we look at what's going on in technology overall, back in 2014, we made our first investment in Benson Hill. They just went public in September. The, the next round of companies are moving in. So if you recall back in the internet days, in the 80s, we sort of had Microsoft and Apple. And then as we approached sort of 1995, 2000 timeframe, companies like Amazon showed up and Google showed up. And, and when they showed up, no one had any idea what, what they were doing. They were like an online book company. What's that? And to, to Kevin's point about these sort of trends, we're, we're at that, we're at that point in time that is, if you, again, put yourself back to sort of that 95, 2000 time frame where, where there just was a whole bunch of stuff swirling around and that the foundations were laid for major changes going in, into 2010, 2020. Uh, and even if you look at the stock price of things like Amazon, it was flat for many years and now everybody wished they were an early investor. So we are at this crossroads where as technology evolves, uh, when we invested in Benson, I think maybe Matt can tell me there were like 12 employees. I, now I don't even know how many employees they are. Uh, there are other companies being inspired by that and where we may have had 150 financings and venture going on in ag tech in 2021 per quarter, we easily could see 300, 400. Uh, occurring next. So the, the wheels are spinning. And yesterday we saw that a little bit, the acre trader conversation and 
how we're re rethinking about land, that's not a technology thing any longer. In 2014, it was what's the optionality on technology? We're now moving into a market where the public markets are saying, okay, how do I make sure capital is used right? What's the next level of investment? You know, maybe we put ag tech, we invested a two, you know, five, six billion over the last few years. Let's put some other zeros behind it. Is this a trillion dollar opportunity? And we're moving into that phase where Blackstone and BlackRock and, and the public markets people are thinking about how to deploy capital. And that, that deployment of capital is gonna be both in terms of new technology, it's gonna be people coming in on real estate and buying the real estate and freeing up capital so that farmers can run their farm, apply capital to improve their operations, to buy the new technology, to compete. And then on a global stage, we see about 3 billion people moving from the class and, and from sovereigns and all the people in the world. If you're in China, their production methods are in the dark ages. If you're in Europe, they've been in denial about GMO and where does science fit in, and they've had this very complex perception about what's going on with technology, and it gets conflicted with with sovereign interests and 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 a confusing mess in terms of move forward. The United States remains in the forefront of applying technology in a reasonable way, applying technology to really advance the ball. And as we think about what's happening next. We spent a whole bunch of time over the last 30 years worried about yield. Now we're worried about yield, nutrition, taste. We spent uh, time, you know, challenges with the environment. We're figuring out how to do it better. We're able to figure out with regenerative farming how to produce higher quality, less waste at a lower cost. And on a global basis, when we talk to people in Europe or we talk to people in China behind closed doors, they pretty much are looking for the United States to lead. And by lead, that means us bringing in the best possible agricultural technology, data, genetics, new crop inputs, and the best producers in the world in terms of everybody in this room who's focused on trying to figure out how to be more competitive, deliver the best product, think hard about advancing it. You, you really are the forefront of those adopters of technology and have been doing it for 40, 50, 60, 100 200 years, um, and so the, the, a lot is going to move quicker, and it's exponential from here, I think, in terms of this food shift. And then near term, there are real market forces. We can fix diabetes by fixing the food system. So people can worry about climate change, what's going to happen 50, 60 years from now, but we all have people in family with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, healthcare costs are getting that. We, with the food system, we can immediately fix many things in the healthcare system. And so we can deliver better quality food, make more money at it, and, and frankly, with the new technology, reduce the cost of those things so that we don't have to get yell at each other. People just adopt better quality products because it's cheaper and better. Yeah, I, I agree, Carter. I, I think we've talked about this many, many times. We see this. We see it playing out. We see a closed loop system coming down the pipe. We see a lot of things that are gonna be different. Um, our good friend Soren Schroeder's here. Soren was a former CEO at Bungie and now doing a lot of angel investing and looking at different things in the ag space. What do you see, Soren? How do you see things shaking out and what are you kind of looking at? Well, uh, where do you start? Um, just thinking back two years ago, Kevin, when we last met, um, that was kind of turned out to be the bottom of the last really nasty cycle in commodities, right? Uh, yeah. we, we didn't really know that at the time. And my interest in, in I guess, looking beyond the traditional horizon of, of ag and food was to try and find ways to, you know, secure the future, not knowing that we would now come in for this enormous upswing. And that was really, I think, what prompted the statement you made earlier. You gotta figure out what you're really good at. Uh, and so if you want to be a commodity producer, then you've got to find a way to be the lowest cost. Uh, but not everybody can do that. Uh, not everybody has the scale or the balance sheet to do that. So the alternative to that, of course, is to try and diversify somehow. Uh, and at that time, my interest in regenerative farming sort of came to life because it seemed like a pretty neat way of making nature work for you. 
And at that time, there were several examples of people who had done this successfully. And since then, it's become kind of a buzzword. Uh, now, I think regenerative farming means different things to different people. Um, to some, it is really nature's way, the way it was 100 years ago or more. Uh, and to others, it means use, use whatever tools available in the toolbox, whether that's seed or alternative inputs to create a healthy soil biome that gives you the same result, i.e., you know, turbocharging it. Uh, I, I don't. I don't really care what definition you, you, you use, but I think the regenerative movement uh, is, is here to stay, and it is one way in which you can diversify uh, as, a, as, as a farmer. Um, I also thought that the idea of, of, of alternative crops, um, not just corn, wheat, and soybeans, but crops that would feed into the future food system, whether that's peas or any of the cover crops now that not only do the soil bit, but also potentially have a yield like cover cress, um, that that was the way to go. Um, so my, my thinking around all this was really born out of the last ugly period of the down cycle. And now here we are two years later and the sky's the limit. Um, and I guess I would just, I'd just say that, you know, for as long as I've been in this business, things come around again. Maybe this cycle will be a, an extra long one. Uh, maybe it's five or six or seven years this time, and certainly the renewable diesel and a lot of the biofuel stuff is helping. Um, but this is the moment, like you said, to really think through uh, how you want your business to look 10 years from now, and you will have the balance sheet to do it with. Uh, but, uh, you know, it would be tempting to just keep doing what you're doing. And I, I would advise against that, because it is, it is gonna come around uh, again, and at that point, you want to be better prepared. I mean, I, I, I do remember those two years ago, and I, I just yeah. left Bungie coming out of a very ugly period in the commodity processing. Well, you know, two years later now, we, we're at a point where you can't, you can't imagine it could ever be that like that again, but it can, and it will. So it's a, it's a brilliant moment in time, really. Um, the other good thing is that there are so many forces um, and so many opportunities, whether that's investing, um, all the new technology that's coming at us, uh, but food trends, that allows you to diversify and allows you to plug into new systems. Um, we can talk more about that, I guess. Um, but it's a brilliant moment in time, don't lose it, I guess is how I'm, I'm looking at it. Yeah, I, I agree with Soren, and he spent the last two days trying to get here to Kansas City, so Soren, I, I, I <laughs> yes. really appreciate it, and I love hearing his thoughts. And if you think about what he said, what did we talk about yesterday to open it up was, it's not how you play your winning hands, any, you know, any monkey can manage a winning position. It's how you play it when the chips are down. It's how you play the losers. And what Soren just say, it's, it's, he thought about it and this came about in the last downstroke. We know there's going to be another downstroke. It's probably right around the corner, not too far. And I listened to Benson tell me on a sales call, I, they said, boy, we're having a tough time getting people to, to try the beans this year because beans are at 15 bucks. <laughs> Remember, Matt, the conversation? Last year, man. Yep. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Now, this is the year to try them. You got to make, yeah, this is the time you, you go for it. We got good prices. This is when you got to make, you got to make the change when you got a chance to make the change. I, I think, I mean, I, a buddy of mine said, choose change before change chooses you. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty true in life. And, uh, you know, it, it's when the times are good is when you got to try the new item. You got to try the pivots and, and, and try to change a few things. Like I just said, hit the pivot. Mitchell Hora. Mitchell's up. I uh, talk, Mitchell, as Soren's talking about regenerative ag, Mitchell's from Iowa. Uh, I think Mitchell's kind of blown up as of late, right? You're, what, uh, Forbes 30 under 30, and Mitchell transitioned to farm. Soren sitting right next to you, and they've done it for a number of years. And kind of tell your story. Yeah, no, appreciate it. And uh, really, you know, appreciate the honor to uh, to be up here and and uh, participate in the panel today. Um, yeah, so yeah, things are, are kind of going crazy in my uh, my world right now, but uh, but definitely all in good, really really good ways. And yeah, this regenerative movement and stuff like we you know have already been talking about here is definitely something that we've been able to ride that wave on 100%. So um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Continuum Ag. We're a soil health data company and a, a startup that's got the software to be able to track and quantify soil health and help farmers to manage it. And we're able to do that because we've been doing it on our own farm for multiple decades. I'm seventh generation on my family's farm. 
We're in Southeast Iowa, uh, over in Washington is kind of the area that we're at. We started no-tilling in 1978, and we've been using cover crops since 2013. And now we've been able to continue to change, kind of to your point, and push the needle even further that in the last couple of years on our farm, we've grown corn, soybeans, rye, wheat, malt barley, mustard, and next year looking even at doing maybe some open pollinated corn and being able to provide a direct to consumer product as well uh, coming, off of our, coming off of our ground. But we're doing these things because we're changing our focus from not just being yield driven. Mm -hmm. Obviously we love yield and love putting a, a tweet out, you know, of you know, 320 bushel corn going, uh, going on the combine monitor, but mm -hmm. it's gotta be bottom line profit. And that's what we're focused on. And by better understanding that soil is alive and that there's more microbes in one teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on the earth, by understanding that concept that the soil is alive, there's all those microbes, you can utilize that to your advantage. And because of that, we've decreased our synthetic fertilizer by 45%. We've decreased our pesticides by 75%. We can infiltrate four inches of rainfall in less than five minutes on our farm. And we were just playing around with some of our economics and stuff. And yeah, now looking at the opportunity to push things even further. And uh, we we're just discussing fertilizer and chemical inputs and stuff yesterday. Finally now getting some prices for some inputs here for this spring. And of course they're through the roof. And uh, we're looking at like, okay, how far can we push our soils to really work for us and really continue to improve our bottom line? And uh, we we're running some numbers and this some of the relay cropping things and diversifying our system is paying off astronomical. It, it's mind blowing. Um, I, I got to tell the story because I'm <laughs> pumped about it. And um, my land cost on my farm is $430 an acre. Okay, I bought ground in 2017 for $89.50 an acre. 15 year term on a beginning farm loan with FSA and my local bank. $430 an acre fixed cost for my my ground. I grew soybeans and cereal rye on part of it last year as a relay crop. My bottom line profit after everything was $556 an acre last year. And I'm selling commodity. This is commodity soybeans too. Nothing fancy. It's GMO. It's a whole deal, but it's just really dialing in and really understanding the power of mother nature, understanding our data and utilizing it to focus solely on that bottom line. Um, that's really that's really my focus, what I wanna, wanna stress here today. But appreciate being here. No, heck no, I, I appreciate it. I had the opportunity to meet Mitchell on a call and I was fascinated by some of the things they have done. Uh, a couple of my other clients in Illinois, a couple other areas have done similar things. They couldn't be here today, but I mean, it's just crazy. While we're on the roll, Melissa, this is Melissa Nelson, uh, really co-founder at South Bend Industrial Hemp. They're doing some crazy things on the industrial hemp side, but she's on the same page with Mitchell and what they've got going. You're out in Great Bend, Kansas, correct? Yes. Yeah, tell us a story. Yeah, so there's three hats that I really wear in the regenerative space. And the first is I farm alongside my brother-in-law and my husband. They've been using regenerative practices for over a decade. So it was very surprising to me as I continue to travel around the, the country and really catch traction with our hemp company how easy it would be for so many of these farmers to implement these simple practices to move towards a more regenerative effort. We're getting there. And that is one reason hemp is, is moving to such a forefront in the conversation. Now, why we're catching so much traction? My background is I'm a field research scientist. So all of these biologicals that they were talking about yesterday was 40% of my workload last year. Uh, I work with companies all over the world to collect data so that they can submit labels to the EPA or they can provide marketing data to these farmers to show whether their products work or don't. Um, I was really excited when Grant was talking about you know, being honest to the farmer, et cetera. I take that job as a researcher so seriously because at the end of the day, the data that I put out affects the bottom line of my friends and family. So as we move towards South Bend Industrial Hemp, and what we're trying to grow there. And before you guys all discount me, because I know many of you have either gotten a black eye or know one, someone that has gotten a black eye from the CBD industry, we're focused on fiber and grain. We're focused on large scale agriculture. We use the equipment that we're using for every other crop within our hemp operation. 
Um, why this is exciting, you know, hemp captures four times more carbon than any other crop. So carbon's the big buzzword right now. You could get paid for that uh, if you find the right program. You've got <coughs> cover crops that we're utilizing. Right now there's no pesticides that can be sprayed on hemp after it's been planted. And so you've got the organic uh, community that is very supportive of this. You see just consumers as a whole wanting to move towards a green movement, healthier living, um, healthier lifestyles, even in the building materials that they use at their home. And so hemp continues to gain traction at a rapid pace. Uh, in 2019, the fiber and grain industry was a $200 million market. Nothing. You know, that's peanuts. We've already grown to over a $23.5 billion market. And we're just getting started. So, again, hemp and what it can do for soil health, utilizing it with cover crops, you know, this is becoming a viable option. In 2016, our farm looked at it because commodity prices were so low. And now hemp is a part of the conversation because input prices are so high. We're competing with the corn and soy acres. You know, the ROI, the bottom line, like Mitch said, that's the most important part and we're competitive. And so we continue to gain traction. We continue coming out to educate about hemp. So many people have such a negative stigmatism to it. Uh, and they still associate it with the CBD industry, but it's very, very different than that. And so that's what we're building in Great Bend. Appreciate it, Melissa. I've met some uh, awesome farmers this year, and so I'm super excited about it. And I've had some crazy good conversations. We'll stay on the producer line, and then we'll circle back with uh, Kelly and Matt to kind of go back to where we are. So be patient with me, Matt. <laughs> Steve McCaskill. Steve, awesome story. Met him. We just kind of hit it off, uh, loved hearing his talk. He's talking and asking me a question about my family, and we're talking about his family. And Braggadocia Rice, biggest provider of rice for Chipotle, direct into Chipotle, direct with Whole Foods. Told me how I landed the account. I'll let him tell you. How, I, I like the inside scoop on, hey, how'd you get the account? It's a, it's a good story, but Steve's, uh, I, I mean, Steve, I, I'm, Glad to call your friend, and I appreciate you coming up, buddy. Thank you. Well, the way I got that account uh, is I called them, and I never gave up. <laughs> exactly. You drive them crazy till they are ready to buy. Tell them that what closed the deal. Huh? Tell them what closed the deal with your wife. So uh, we, we went to an organic conference in St. Louis in 2013, and I noticed on the flyer that uh, the district manager in the St. Louis area for Chipotle uh, was a speaker, and I told Kay, I said, we've got to go to that. And I took some samples of our rice. We had already started selling our rice uh, to Whole Foods uh, and other grocery chains and stuff. And so after his talk, you know, I said who I was and showed him our rice. I said, I want to talk to somebody in corporate. And the following week, he sent me an email of a young lady uh, in the Denver, Colorado office at that time uh, who to contact. And we started an email conversation. We had to send samples of our rice off to the University of Missouri food labs for mold and mildew testing. Everything checked and nothing was happening. It was very frustrating. So I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, Kay and I, and Kay is sitting in the back with uh, the wild bunch from Southeast Missouri back there. And uh, I said, we would like to come out and meet you and some other people and let's talk. And she agreed and we flew to Denver and we had our meeting, it lasted 10 minutes. We spent more time visiting Denver than we did with Chipotle. <laughs> but we got back home Kay goes, what do you think? I said, I really don't know. Uh, it, I've always heard about the corporate world being cold. I said, it was cold. <laughs> and about two or three weeks later, she calls and she says, how would you like to start selling rice to the Little Rock Chipotle store in Little Rock, Arkansas? And I said, we sure would. And she said, we also would like to come and visit your farm this fall. And I said, that would be great. And so... Uh, 
she and the co-CEO at the time, the CFO and a couple of other people flew into Kennett, Missouri, and I picked them up, and we were harvesting rice at the time, and we put each one on the combine uh, and let them sit in the driver's seat and drive the combine. They were harvesting rice, and it was like watching kids uh, with a toy. They were very excited. Uh, we, t we came back to the farm headquarters. I had them climb up to the top of one of our bins and look inside, and it was like 18,000 bushels of popcorn that we grow, and they couldn't believe it. The next thing I knew, they were climbing in the bin, playing king on the hill. And these are corporate executives. <laughs> and I said, stop, stop, there's metal down in the bottom. You gotta get out of there. So then we went and took a group picture in front of 250,000 pounds of chicken manure. And they got a real kick out of that. <laughs> but the highlight of the trip was Kay prepared a barbecue lunch and uh, all kinds of sides and stuff. And so uh, for dessert, she cooked an organic carrot cake. That's what you're talking about, yeah. the carrot cake. Yes. Oh. And uh, Monty Moran, who was the co-CEO at the time, he, he was floored at the barbecue and he took a bite of the carrot cake and he goes, this is the best carrot cake I've ever ate in my life. He says, <laughs> we'll buy all the rice you want to grow. <laughs> Steve's, Steve's like, I think it was that damn carrot cake just closed them. I think the I carrot know. cake closed <laughs> You got, you got to remember the carrot cake story when you're trying to close the deal. Um, but we have a, a wonderful relationship with them. We're in many, many stores. All of the Chipotles in Missouri and Iowa, a few in Kansas, Arkansas. And we do deliveries, direct deliveries in Memphis and Nashville. Um, and everything's going good. Uh, we've been organic since 93. Uh, I was really getting frustrated with conventional farming, which I was into it for 20 years. Uh, the price of cotton, the price of dryland soybeans back in the early, late 80s and early 90s, it was horrible. And we, we heard about an organic meeting coming up in Portageville, Missouri at the University of Missouri Delta Center. And a company called Esprit, uh, a California clothing company came there were farmers from West Tennessee, Northeast Arkansas, and Southeast Missouri there. And we were listening to this story. Nobody ever heard of organic cotton before. Uh, we've heard of organic foods and uh, supplements and stuff. But when they said, we will pay a dollar a pound for the cotton lint, and at the time, cotton prices were probably 40 cents a pound. I didn't say anything out loud, but I knew I was in. I was ready for that dollar no matter what it took. And so that's how we got into organic farming. Uh, one highlight was we joined a 5013C in Fresno, California. And one of the meetings that we went to, Kay and I went to, we got to meet with Yvonne Chenard, the founder and owner of Patagonia. And we took him out and started talking about organic cotton. And in California, they water, the, the water's brought in concrete troughs or ditches, and, the, and the, the runoff is also caught in concrete ditches and hauled to these uh, depository areas that looks like the moon. There's nothing growing there, and he saw this. And he, after that meeting, he said, I'll, I'll buy your organic cotton. And today, even today, they're still buying organic cotton. I'm not gonna get into why organic cotton or anything like that, but uh, at that time, it was a very special thing. We had an F4 tornado in 06, uh, April the 2nd of 2006, and it completely wiped us out. Um, we lost everything, even the family cotton gin where we were ginning the organic cotton. And we didn't know what we were gonna do. We lost two thirds of our home. Um, it, it was a disaster. But a few months prior to that, I had talked to a rice mill company in Brinkley, Arkansas about organic rice. 
And I called them and I told them what had happened and that I'd like to try 80 acres of organic rice. And so we did. Uh, he told me what he would pay for it and it was a much bigger premium than conventional rice. And I had never even grown rice before. Uh, so here we are entering the rice market with organic rice, my first time. But it went good, we got paid. They were excited. They wanted us to do not only long grain, but basmati rice. And we started grading ground and getting our landlords excited about it. And what we were really excited about was the premium of this crop that we were getting. Um, at the time, uh, conventional rice was around $5 a bushel. Um, where we live, we call it bushels. Some places call it hundredweight. And down in Louisiana, they call it barrel. So, but we're at bushels. It's a 45 pound uh, per bushel product. And we were getting $9 a bushel for it. And I thought, man, this is, we have arrived. This is fantastic. And so we started growing and growing. And one of my friends that worked for Extension, uh, Dr. Van Ayers, uh, he's not with them anymore. He retired and moved back to Middle Tennessee where he grew up. He said, you need to build a rice mill because we were using uh, the rice mill in Brinkley, Arkansas at the time to package our rice and to bring it back. We were putting stickers on it, uh, lot, lots of hands-on work. Um, and so the state of Missouri uh, has grants for value-added agriculture. Uh, where you can do a feasibility study, you can do a business plan, all of it's paid for, which you really need to know if your idea is feasible or not. And our idea of an organic rice mill was feasible. And then we applied for the new gen state income tax credits. Uh, we got a big chunk of money and uh, that helped pay off the construction loan of our rice mill. And so here we go. Our first year in business was 2015 with our own rice mill, and none of us had ever had any experience with rice mills. I was at our local gym, gym working out, and I saw a friend of mine that I grew up with that was in the same high school class, and he's very smart, and I said, what are you doing now? His name is Bubby, and he goes, well, I just retired from a natural gas company, and uh, I'm not doing anything. And I said, how would you like to work at a rice mill? He goes, Steve, I don't know anything about a rice mill. I said, I don't know either. <laughs> so we got him in and uh, we're in the poorest county in the state of Missouri, Pemiscot County. And today we have 11 people on the payroll from that area that really never had a good job before. Uh, we're paying $15 an hour. Um, and we have vacation pay and health care pay and all kinds of things. Um, now the story's going to change a little bit. Um, we, uh, we got involved with some brokers and uh, we started sending braggadocia rice and braggadocia popcorn across the country. Uh, Publix grocery chain, uh, HEB, everything's just going fantastic. And then uh, a new herbicide uh, came out and we, we had already gone through the, the perils of Roundup and it never really bothered us that much. But here comes a new herbicide called Dicamba. And it literally, uh, it just, we, we're, it has completely dramatically affected our company and our business, mainly because of the damage the stunting and the killing that it was doing to our non-GMO soybeans. Uh, we had to quit growing non-GMO soybeans, which was our refuge crop with organic rice production. We were able to kill several weed flushes before we planted the non-GMO beans. And uh, so we didn't know what we were gonna do. So in 21, we planted all of our soybean acres in that rotation with dicamba soybeans. We were the only non-GMO soybean grower uh, left and 2020 was our last year. 
So we really don't know what the future holds at this point, but at the same time, and here's a pivot that you were talking about. Um, I started thinking long, and bef long before we thought about quitting growing non-GMO beans that we need to do something different besides organic rice. And I kept thinking sustainable rice, and that was not the right word. Um, I saw Anheuser-Busch offering rice farmers 50 cents a bushel more if they would cut water back 10% and synthetic nitrogen back 10%. And uh, so in the fall of 2020, uh, a company from Nashville, Tennessee, an ag tech company called AgriCapture uh, called, and I knew of them, and I knew them, some of them. Uh, I was their organic consultant for years when they were doing limited partnerships and buying farmland years ago. They came and started talking about carbon credits. And, you know, I was, I was all in it. I, I thought, this is great. I had heard about it through some other companies, and I heard that it wasn't going very well, and a lot of people were getting disappointed. And uh, they, they had a whole new outlook on this and how they were going to approach it. And while we were there, I said to the founder, I said, what we need to do is we need to sell the crops at a premium that are grown on land that's getting carbon credits. And so we came up eventually with uh, climate-friendly rice. Um, and it's certified by AgriCapture. It's been quantified, it's been measured, everything that we're doing on the farm, our inputs, our tillage practices, which are virtually none, because you need to be no-till or minimum till to be climate friendly. But we have reached a point now where we are selling climate friendly rice uh, to some existing customers and hopefully more will follow in the next few weeks. Um, they are also uh, certifying our popcorn crop. We are now, uh, we will be now selling certified climate friendly popcorn and they are working on just regular uh, genetically modified soybeans and corn. Hopefully the premium prices that we are looking for will help everybody. Um, and I, I know I'm talking too much and the last thing I want to say is after I heard Chris with cash rents last night, yesterday afternoon, uh, I looked at J.R. France back there and I said, boy, this is scary. Yeah. <laughs> and, but those of us who are concerned about it, if you can get into some sort of climate friendly and you can use herbicides and you can, you can use some synthetic nitrogen, it's, really, it's a whole lot easier to get into it than organic farming, a whole lot easier. But you can get into this market, hopefully we'll have premiums available for beans and corn in the very near future, and you can, you can tell your landowner that you're farming for that you're gonna help them get carbon credits and you're going to help them get a premium on the crops being grown on that farm. This will be cash rent any day, so. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I appreciate it, Steve. I, I, I appreciate it. I think the takeaway and what I love from Steve and I, you know, he, he does it. He goes out and networks, goes out, and he's, he doesn't overthink the situation and just gives it a shot and gives it a whirl and sees where it comes out. And, I, I mean, it's, it's awesome that how things have worked out for you. So, congratulations. And Travis, you back on there? You're in the pickup? Yep, I'm in the pickup. Uh, we've got about a foot of snow. It's, it's uh, about 20 degrees and blowing. It's uh, no, it's Idaho. How's it, how's everything going? Talk to everybody about how tractor soda, how you guys are, and what's happening. You know, we're doing good. It's uh, it's like like a Steve. I appreciate his failing forward. You know, keep on doing it until uh, it either works or it doesn't. But uh, what we what we found was is as we've gone through this journey of creating better beverages for people uh, and competing with the big boys is that being diligent, like Steve said, it's not just going asking somebody once if they'll buy from you, but doing it for five or six years might have to pay off eventually. 
But what we found is is uh, that like like any curve, uh, especially with the, with the current pandemic stuff, people are still looking. I mean, they're more than ever going away from trying to get healthy by taking taking different things to changing their food, and that that's going over to the restaurant industry quickly. And that's our that's really our business is selling to the restaurant industry, giving them an option other than what they have. Uh, but it's been really good. Like we've had some just they call it hockey stick growth. Uh, we're we're just starting. Uh, we had a massive year this past year um, in a funky time, and and uh, it's the opportunities that we have in front of us are better than they've ever been. You know, a lot of us think about it like, uh, should we have been born 100 years ago? It might have been easier. I don't think so. I think we're all meant to be here right now, doing what we're doing and learning from what we're doing and making the world a better place by doing it. There is going to be a significant difference in change going forward. Uh, as I talk to people that are the major buyers of everything from protein to grains to drinks um, in this country. I'm seeing them really looking at uh, alternatives, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like ice cream. Uh, vanilla and chocolate sell the most all the time. The weird, interesting things are fun to do, but they don't really make the money. So uh, most of these people, most, most everybody that's here uh, works off of something that's already working, but you're gonna have to get a little bit better and smarter at it. It's not necessarily, uh, it, it really you need to decommoditize what you're doing and make more margin. We're never, we've never been at a place ever where we could do subscription sell sales for things. We can sell directly to people without brokers, without all the middlemen that are in there uh, more than right now. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. The other part that we're seeing, uh, this is kind of the challenge side is as you grow, you need, you need enough ingredients of whatever you're doing to be able to produce it enough for the masses. We built our company based off of uh, taking out the taking out the fat in the middle and you know adding healthier products and selling for about the same price. But eventually you, you, you're gonna run out of product. So part of that is, is we're gonna need more ingredients in the future um, or you have to reformulate. This year we took out about 35% uh, of the sugar that's in our products and they still taste great by using something as simple as some herbs and berries from all around the globe. They're part of the, Part of our innovation and in creating new products now for a market that's massive, in a, and, and we're, in, we're in the beverage industry, that, you know, that, that, that company is, there's a 2% success rate in beverage. That's not very big. Like there are a lot of people that try it. I'm not saying to go try it because you have to have rhino skin, but, uh, but in that you have to keep innovating and thinking and cranking out new, new ways of doing things. Uh, one pallet of our product is the same as a full truckload of bottles. So we didn't do bottles. We do bottles now, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. And that's part of the learning process of, you know, something as simple as like not being able to get bottle caps because they're on the ocean. It makes you think like, I guess we're gonna have to make our own glass or make our own bottles. You start cranking on ideas. Sometimes they're expensive and stupid and sometimes they actually make sense. Like they were talking about hemp. I could see the, the hemp it, in all these things, by the way, most of all of our ingredients are waste product. We don't use the beautiful stuff. We use the ugly stuff. You don't make juice out of perfect fruit. And uh, going into that, in the hemp market, people are looking at CBD, but the money really is in the waste product. I, I can see easily, as I talk to a lot of these people, going, you know, hemp straws and hemp boxes and hemp plastic and all those things are, are going to be on trend over the next five to ten years. I was talking to Carter about that a few years ago. But it's coming more and more clear um, as – Supply chain issues are a difficult thing all over the globe to being able to use alternatives in what you farm, not necessarily just for nutrition, taste, and, and, uh, and to create revenue that way, but using that waste product to make something interesting and different that uh, doesn't have to be shipped. We're finding more and more that uh, the, more, the longer you have to ship it, that your, your chances of failure are much higher. So go, that goes into producing something closer, and as farmers – a lot of you guys are doing commodity stuff, but going back to what I said a couple of years ago is you, you might want to have a couple acres set aside doing some interesting things like geothermal greenhouses and make some extra cash. You may you might make a lot more money per square foot than you do per square acre of what you're doing. So in tractor in general, where we're at is uh, we have major growth. We've kept it skinny for a long time. Uh, we don't have a lot of employees. We outsource a bunch. We are dealing with farmers and, and uh, supply chain stuff all over the globe, and it's been pretty good. But there are common issues that we, we worry about in citrus and other things that are a mess. So we are continuously thinking about 
you know, uh, what, what, uh, what type of citrus can we grow that isn't a orange, lemon, uh, lime, grapefruit, because some of those are having some major issues and the costs are going up, grapefruit and, and limes especially. Uh, then we look at alternative different types like calamansi and, and different interesting things. And that's where it comes back to uh, sometimes you can't be narrowly focused on one thing and expect it to be successful forever, but to pivot when you have issues. And that's even with formulating products and making it taste like it should. Sometimes you just run out of whatever it is. And so that means you have to have an alternative to figure it out. Um, in that, we still work on how to, can we make it healthy? Can we make it nutritious? Is it good to even grow for the farmer? Um, and does it make sense to put in a product that you can sell to people? Then it's customer ex acceptance. Of all the things we do, we sell a lot of lemonade, we sell a lot of tea. And those are two very simple things. Uh, we didn't start that way. We started out with all kinds of eccentric sodas and different fun things. But at the end of the day, it's that simple stuff that everybody uses, just making it better. I, pr I appreciate it, Travis. Let's go to Kelly. Kelly James, CEO of Macaris. Kelly, uh, she's also on the Zoom call. If um, Tell us what, I think I always get to call, you know, what, what should producers be looking to grow? What are we seeing happen in some of the specialty crops? What peas, chickpeas, what are we, you know, mung beans? Where, where are we seeing opportunity, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there. COVID finally uh, caught up with my household. So <laughs> I'm riding it out here at home. Um, but I miss getting to see everyone. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Mercaris. We provide market information. We're a price reporting agency for organic and non-GMO and, you know, broadly speaking, identity preserved crops uh, and commodities. We also run a trading platform for those same things. Um, my background, though, what I would say kind of ties my career together is financial innovation in these sort of emerging sustainable markets. So, gosh, 15 years ago, I was one of the OGs of a carbon marketplace called the Chicago Climate Exchange. It was a cash market for carbon and then futures and options on carbon and renewable energy and a whole bunch of environmental derivatives. And so um, while I can absolutely talk about things like, you know, organic foods, uh, which are still um, it's a long running trend now. You know, you've got 15, 20 years of data where you're seeing um, year on year growth of, you know, between five and, and 10%. 2020, when COVID kicked off and everyone was driven back to the grocery store and out of restaurants, we saw um, double digit growth. So 12% growth um, for, uh, for organic food sales. So it's a, it's a long term, it's not one of these sort of flash in the pan. I, I sympathize with growers trying to make decisions about investments you got to make up front and consumer sentiment can change so quickly, you know, and, and then next year it's something different. So it's hard to say, well, you know, I want to do a, I know people who still talk about the Atkins diet and how it changed the, the, the equation for anybody who was growing wheat. And now nobody even really talks about that. You know, it's, it's, it's something that's just a distant memory. So it's hard to know. Um, I like the idea that Travis and some of the others said about, you know, try it, try it on a small scale, you know, do, do five, 10, 15 acres or something. Um, do a greenhouse and, and see how it goes. Um, so there's always every year there's something, you know, new plant protein. I'm not going to tell anyone new about what, you know, consumers are seeing. What I will say is something that's near and dear to my heart is what kind of unlocks the potential for these things, whether they're carbon markets or whether they're, they're organic or something else. And a lot of times I think it is financial innovation. And so um, I, I always pay attention to what are the new tools available for unlocking value uh, for something that we know is, is going on and just could be scaled or made more efficient if there's a new way to do it. So carbon markets are one example, you know, how do you find those buyers? I will be a little bit, um, I don't know if you call it con contrarian, but having been through the carbon market cycle once before, I think the carbon market is not sustainable from a financial point of view until there's a defined source of demand. So it's nice that Microsoft announces it's buying carbon credits this year and such and such you know, advised, is, is advising they're gonna buy carbon next year. But you want a sort of mandate um, so that you know that demand is there going forward five years out, 10 years out, so you can make those on-farm investments and get something more than you know, a few pennies here or there, or, or even some significant revenue this year, but you don't know if it's coming next year or not. And that's when farming practices will really change and reorient when there's a defined market. Sometimes that comes through government mandate, Sometimes that comes through, you know, industry norms or consumer activism, shareholder activism. But I do think you need a sustained source of demand in order for this to, to really unlock the potential uh, here. 
Um, at Mercaris, one of the things that we're doing is, it doesn't sound sexy, but we're providing the really good cash data that lets people build risk management tools off of that data. So we talk about on-farm data, what do you use that for? How do you turn it in for, into information? The price data from knowing that organic soybeans right now are trading for $32 per bushel, up from $19 a bushel last year, is what lets you build insurance products, is what lets you build swap contracts or futures contracts, or you know all those things that help you manage price risk and remove one more barrier to entry for those along the supply chain whose balance sheets are exposed to fluctuating you know, prices. So that's, I, I know we're trying to keep to time and there's still a lot of great speakers left. So I'll stop there and maybe in the Q and A mm -hmm. or um, Kevin, I think, I mean, you know how to get a hold of me. If anyone wants to talk afterwards, it's a little strange having to come. Uh, I, I missed the, the contact of just getting to see and talk with everyone, but I, um, I, you can easily find me after the conference is over and we can, we can talk more. Perfect, Thank Kelly. You. I appreciate you taking the time. Hope the family's well and everyone's yeah, doing good. I, I love talking to Kelly when, if farmers, if you're thinking about making a pivot or a change or getting into a specialty crop. I mean, they, I just think they're a great tool. Like she just said, you know, organic beans going for 32 bucks. And I mean, I can never get a good handle exactly where prices are in some of the non-traditional crops. And I think they're gonna be the place where we get that open marketplace and we get the tools to kind of figure that out. So, <clears throat> you know, I would, I would pay attention to what they have going on. Let's turn to Matt, my man, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> kind of the rock star uh, of the quarter here, right? Come out, rock big star. IPO. Rock star. Take Benson to the next uh, level here, unicorn valuations. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, well, thanks for having <coughs> me. Kevin. It's great to see everybody. I enjoy this, this crowd a great deal. Um, I enjoy the content here a lot. Um, for those of you who don't know Benson Hill, we're a, a food technology company, uh, but we're, we're I, I'll say, uh, with emphasis, technology company that's really linking the farmer with the consumer. And, and I think we can all appreciate that. And, and a lot of the speakers here have offered, you know, in the commodity context, we've been really, really good at building scale. And we have a system that's more productive than any other system in the world here in the US. Um, but there's a quality component that we have in many respects left behind. And so what Benson Hill's really focused on doing right now and in the protein category with soy and in yellow pea is uh, creating more nutrition density, creating a higher quality bean, you know, that effectively a market is emerging to pay for. And, and that market is massive. And I think if we were to look 10 years ago and say, uh, you know, what is the vegetarian alternative meat burger, uh, alternative chicken nugget kind of market, uh, at a farmer level, a lot of folks might have looked at that and, and thought we, what I would have thought, and that is that this is very niche, that this is, this is a, a pretty small market. But um, a conglomeration of factors have come together, accelerated actually by COVID, interestingly enough, that have, have and are providing enormous tailwinds for this market. Uh, I read yesterday Barclays put out a research note their 2022 base case growth for the alternative uh, plant-based meat <coughs> substitute market is 35%. It's expected to go from, you know, a few billion dollars today to $160 billion globally by the end of the decade. And, and that's a retail value, but if we want to think about what that means on farm, think that about a third of that retail value is the cost and the majority of that cost, so think 20, 30 plus billion dollars, is the base protein ingredient that goes into these products. That's as big as the global seed market combined in every country for every crop. So when we think about how can we take that value that's being created and that the consumer is willing uh, to pay for and, and bring it back to the farm, you've got to run a closed loop system. You've got to run identity preservation. And so we've developed a portfolio of non-GMO soy that we're out with now, currently contracting for 2022, which will be our third year. Uh, initially 30,000 acres in 2020, last year uh, 70,000 acres uh, coming into 2022 will we'll grow again in a significant way. But what we're doing is we're paying you, well, many of you all, 
a premium to grow a crop that provides this uh, very high nutrition density, so high that when we take it and I preserve its identity from the commodity system, we can actually eliminate the need to execute some of the processing that's extremely expensive, right? And it's also, as the group's pointing out, uh, it's also uh, checking a big box of sustainability. These processing steps that create that base protein ingredient today are very water and energy intensive. And so Benson Hill is, is, is and I didn't know what this term was until last year, but you know, is, is what folks call a pure play uh, ESG company. Um, which means that for every pound, for every ton uh, of ingredient that we sell, we're actually just by virtue of being successful in making that sale, we're eliminating uh, energy intensity and water intensity in the system. And, and, and that is the kind of thing that I think, I think Kelly's right, I think the carbon markets uh, will command or, or, or need more support. But uh, when we talk about the size and scale of a market like the alternative plant-based category, uh, I think that it, it will help and, and provide an impetus, a catalyst. The last thing I might offer when we're talking about these markets is um, folks go, well, gosh, you know, do we really think that we're not going to eat meat, right? I'm a meat eater. Um, do we really think that this is a, I'm going to, all the, all the crowd's going to go over here. And despite the astronomical growth rate that I just talked about in this alternative plant-based market, we have to remember that globally, as fast as the middle class is growing, the meat market, even then, will continue to grow. The meat market at the same time in 2029, animal protein market, will be a little over $1.4 trillion globally. So, so $160 billion sounds like a lot, but it's really expected to be about 10% of that global protein market. And so there's opportunities on both ends of that spectrum. I'm going to I'm going to try and dumb it down <clears throat> for myself. I have to listen to what Matt says and then I have to like what it, what is happening here? I want to make sure I'm right too, Matt. A company, let's say like Impossible, Beyond, any of the fake meat people. They can contract their people who come up with their taste, recipe, whatever they need. They can contract with a Benson. You can use your technology, create the genetics to grow that particular seed for that particular company. Right, that's right. And we can, con you then, you can call me and say, hey, you got anybody around this area that would be interested in growing these beans or peas or whatever we move that's into right. to for Benson? Exactly, and, and, when, and when we talk about the relationship that we have with our farmer partners, you know, we're working with them very in a, in a bilateral manner. This isn't a, I sell you some inputs and then you go and run down the value chain. It, it is a very much a, a relationship that's developed and it's a linkage to these types of customers who are willing to pay for these <coughs> products. And by the way, one other thing I wanna point out, this is a relatively new phenomena is when these guys come in, let's say a, a Kellogg or a Nestle, and they come into our office, one of the things they're asking now that I didn't hear two years ago is, is all of this production coming from the United States? Yeah. Because of the supply chain dislocations and the challenges that we've had there, this is becoming increasingly important and in a, in a, a quote-unquote local manner is an asset that we sometimes overlook but that market is plagued with a bunch of crap that can come in from Asia, low quality stuff. And now it's not just lower quality, but they don't even know if it's gonna show up. So there's a lot of risk mitigation that's happening simultaneous to this market demand side. Uh, that's, that's again, it's converging into what I think is gonna be a fantastic, not just near term, but long term opportunity. Um, for full disclosure, I have a decent amount of our wealth invested in Benson Hill. I think I've made that crystal clear a long time. Through Carter's business that I select, also on the open market. Many of my friends in the audience have what we consider a decent amount invested with Benson. Make sure you understand when he talks closed loop, we believe 
the industry is going this direction. Closed loop simply means this. He gets the uh, beyond me or, or whoever it may be, whoever they're using moving forward that comes to them. They have a team of scientists that they've hired at the Danforth Center and other places like they were going to original idea that I had in my head. I'm talking myself, not Matt. And Amazon World Services uh, and AWS, but they were going to do it back end with a lot of scientists and people could use that science team to then outsource and create their next models for beans, seed, whatever it may be. Now you have people going direct to Matt at Benson and they're simply saying, hey, we need this dietary combination concocted. Can your team come up with that, the profiling? They create that. They grow it in a clo closed loop, means they go then get the farmer. Now the whole loop is closed. You got the person, the end user that wants it. They're creating the seed specifically for that person. You got the grower on the other end. The circle's closed. It allows margins to be better for everyone in the program. That's why I'm saying I think that's going to be huge as we move forward and we see this what we consider possibly a revolution in the food space. I thought, I've been on calls with Walter and we've talked. Let's take it a step further. Forget the food space. Go aqua, like Walter was talking. What about the meal that's being fed to the, to, to the salmon? What if now if Benson creates a, a, a bean that is a better biological for, for the salmon? And all of a sudden, oh, climate-friendly salmon fed with the beans that you're growing that are going to be crushed at the facility that they just bought in Iowa or another facility, crushed facility that they buy. The loop's closed. You're either in it or you're out of it. I would be paying attention to this. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm on a lot of calls a lot throughout the day. I feel this is where things are going to go. And I, I think it can be a big windfall if, if I think logistically some things are going to have to be right. You're going to have to be somewhat in proximity to the facilities. I think there'll be more crushed facilities pop up like Walter talks, like, like all the bigger. Hey, we, we bought one this week. I know. I saw it announced. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. They just bought one this week because you have to basically have the whole crush because it's too tedious right. to. Right. So right. Th that's what I'm saying. It's early. It's early. But I think. If, if my logic is correct and what I'm hearing is correct and the pieces are correct and the world's moved by the stories it loves and believes in, if this is right, I think this is where, unless Soren's right, if this is where we think it's going, I, 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 I think, guys, that, that we have to be paying a, a real close attention, very close. Well, and, Kevin, to add to this, you, the conversation we have an acre, uh, acre trader yesterday and such is is the next facilitating component of what Matt's doing in terms of if I'm an opera, if I, if I'm making beans for Matt and I'm doing a good job and I want to expand, how do I get access to more land? And then the other things we've been talking about biologics, Matt's got end customers that are more concerned about that. They're confused. They're working with Matt to figure it out. Matt's helping the, the farmer understand it. You're going to see all these systems keep moving in that direction. Amazon, everybody thought it was a books company. It's a lot more. And so that whole system is starting to line it and you're seeing it happen right in front of you. I, I agree. And I'll turn to the story. I'm just saying this. When they come to your area, we had, we sent out that one email, had 600 producers call, call in and write in and say, yeah, we're interested. We want to do something. Well, we couldn't do it all over the country. They only have a few facilities right now, a, a couple of crush locations. But as you see them start to move your way, I would suggest getting on board early because what we're seeing is most of the producers we brought on are wanting to add more acres as it moves forward. Now we're able to add more things. Do, now all of a sudden you contract with new people. Hey, who wants these acres? Hey, who wants this crop? Hey, who wants this crop? And that's how we see it. Yeah. Uh, you brought up aquaculture, so I just have to plug this for a second. It's not a bet, to, to Kevin's point here, what we're doing isn't a bet per se on 
the alternative plant-based oh, meat yeah. market. It, it's a, that's a very sexy thing to talk about because of the, of the growth rate. But you know, we're, we're in, we have a very good relationship, I can say that, with one of the largest trout producers in North America. And there very much are things you can do with the natural genetic diversity of a soybean that make that fish more healthy, higher yielding, and again, by disintermediating some of the processing, a more sustainable source of protein. So very much a, an attractive market. Yeah, Soren, go ahead. One, one, um, one comment. Yeah. Um, the close look story uh, reminded me of, of, of something in, in canola. Um, if you go back, I'm thinking 15 years ago or something like that, high Lake canola was a specialty crop. Uh, we, you know, we grew and contracted with Canadian farmers small amounts around our crushing plants. Then fast forward 10 years, it has become exactly what you're talking about. A, I mean, millions of acres of high canola that is now produced at the same scale as any other kind of canola, any other soybeans in comparison. So where you have the benefit of a trait, in your case is protein, in this case it was a special type of oil, but at the same cost point of production as the original commodity. So it does work. And canola is actually, high-olate canola is a good example of what happens if you get in early enough uh, and, and you, obviously somebody has to sponsor it yeah. uh, and make the capacity available to make all this happen at scale. Because I, I do think that the way this will work really well in the long run is if you can get these closed loop systems to the size where they compete with commodity today. That's where we have to get to. And canola is an example of it. It does work. The, what, one question then, uh, uh, Matt, if you listen to Walter about you know, renewable diesel and the need for oil, uh, I know you're focused on protein at the moment, but, but we really need also, uh, maybe it's both, uh, but it's more oil. So whether that is more oil than the soybean or another crop, uh, rapeseed, you know, some, some sort of canola crop grown in the U.S. with high oil content to feed this, the, this monster demand. Are you in a position to to talk about that? Well, I can, I can say that there, there is a, um, there's certainly, this is all based on genetics, there's certainly an opportunity to increase the oil content, gross oil content in soy. Um, the areas that we're principally focused on, uh, actually it's funny you bring up high oleic, we have a, a portfolio, part of the portfolio which is high oleic, low linolenic, uh, non-GMO soil, it's actually the only one that's on the market right now. And uh, it's soy is such a terrific crop, by the way. I mean, think about, y you could create multiple premium revenue streams off of the oil and, and the protein. So th that's the, that, that, there's synergy in between those two because again, you're executing one closed loop system for two premium revenue streams. But uh, the short answer to your question in the RD stuff is, no, we're not doing anything right now that's investing in the gross oil uh, content uh, increase. We're really more focused on the quality side. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Steve, what'd you have? The whole key to what happens in the near future will be uh, determined by the next largest consumer group, the millennials. And they are more concerned about the environment and our atmosphere than just about anything else that's going on. A lot of them, uh, I've read stories about the anxiety that a lot of them are, are feeling. They feel like our government is not doing enough and they're going to demand a change going forward. And what you were saying, it's, it's, it's for real. Uh, we've got to farm more climate friendly and what a wonderful PR statement that would be for the American farmer to be involved in reducing greenhouse gas emissions going forward. We, it, we're, we're the new Amazon forest, okay, going forward. Go ahead, Melissa. In conjunction with that, if you do not have someone on your team that is social media focused, get one. I mean, that's how we're getting such a reach with this millennial crowd. I had someone yesterday message me and said, hey, I've got a 6,000 square foot house. I want to grow it with hemp. How many acres do I need you to plant to, to provide my house? They're like, we want to see it in the field. We want to see it from start to finish. We want 
the data for the carbon capture. Like obviously this person is very innovative and, and pushing the envelope, but they're not the only one. I, you know, we get calls like that every week and you have to share your story. Millennials are extremely attached to feeling connected, feeling like there's a purpose. And so we have so many people invested in our operation and our farm and my research com uh, com community because they see our story. They see what we're trying to build. And a lot of farmers are in that generation where they don't love social media or maybe they don't understand it, but it's a powerful tool that you need to use for your farm if you really want to make change. I think Melissa says exactly what we talked about. That's why we created the conference and pivoted the name a little bit. You, you, we we got to become more business-centric and more business-minded. You have to tell your own story. You have to brand yourself. That's why I commend the Sproles sitting here and the girls and, and the work they've done and, and, and Normersons and the other people that are, you know, you really have to brand you, who you are and brand that story, right, Mitchell? I mean, you guys are seeing that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I started my company um, in 2015, graduated from Iowa State here a couple years ago, and my first full-time hire was for marketing. <clears throat> and yeah, it's huge. I mean, I, that's where we get all of our customers in. That's why we're in the spot that we are. And, um, you know, and yeah, now we're, I, I get new users and stuff on our platform all the time, and it's all kinds of different, even countries and everything too. It's really amazing that ability to tell the story. And as I'm sitting here listening to really good conversation, you know, I'm thinking about, so many of these really interesting outcomes that we can now create and new opportunities and it's all really exciting and to me now i'm thinking about the awesome opportunity to finally really use our data as farmers i really don't think we've really been able to use it before but now we can and especially through machine learning through a better understanding of that big data we can take any of these outcomes reverse engineer them down to that action item on our farm and obviously i'm biased towards it starts in the soil, and by better managing soil, by better implementing regenerative ag, we can sequester carbon, we can improve nutrient density, we can improve water quality, we can improve you know, biodiversity and habitat, whatever that outcome that we want, because uh, it for sure is gonna be more closed loop, for sure gonna be more transparent, for sure gonna be more you know, just open, but in order to create that you know, differentiated market, there has to be a reason to keep that product separate. And it's that story and it's that data and that's really where the opportunity comes for us as farmers. And uh, you know, and to me, I wanted to make sure, you know, as we're talking about, you know, differentiating through, you know, being more regenerative, being more sustainable, whatever buzzword you want to call it, we've got to be able to come together as a farming community to better define some of these things, I think too. There's a lot of gray area, there's a lot of ambiguity, there's, you know, an, a big concern for greenwashing. And uh, especially in, you know, in carbon markets stuff, I can provide my two cents on it. But, uh, you know, my definition of soil health and, and managing our farms is that we're just creating balance in the soil, balance in the chemical, physical, and biological component. We're creating a balanced, you know, a balanced fertility program, balancing our soils, balancing our inputs, balancing our financials, balancing our livelihoods. And then my definition of regenerative agriculture is that it's a continuous implementation upon your principles of soil health to minimize that disturbance, keep armor, living roots, the diversity, the animal integration where possible, all in the context of your farm. It's that continual improvement, showing that story, bringing about that data to really drive the ultimate merit. And the last kind of real point that I, I want to drive home is I think that better understanding of the data, the better understanding of the outcomes is where there's opportunity. Where we're seeing the inverse of that is what I believe is happening in the carbon markets or in other sustainability initiatives today. Where a lot of these programs that are being developed right now are really just check the box, privatize cost share, you weren't doing this, now you're gonna do this and we'll pay you for the difference. Well, it doesn't necessarily really have anything to do with your actual impact on the real root of the problem. And what we've got to be able to do is better reverse engineer and understand that we can draw down carbon, but carbon is not stable and solid in the soil, except for kind of as coal and diamonds. Those are pretty stable forms of carbon. But in the soil, 
carbon is a solid, a liquid, and a gas. It's dynamic, and it's a, that carbon that's going to allow us to be more sustainable, going to allow us to improve the quality of the product and improve our impact. And I believe that through any of these initiatives, that that grower should be rewarded based on their merit and based on the real impact, the real opportunity. I love the nutrient density piece. I think that is the ultimate in this because we know that that consumer will pay for quality and, and even a perception of quality. And, and again, that's where the telling the story and the social media is huge. But now we can really bring about real definable quantitative quality metrics and, uh, and really be able to highlight our story. So some real, real exciting things, you know, from my perspective going into this, um, but some real opportunity for, for research um, interesting to see, you know, where the government's going to play into this. And I think that's, you know, the real piece is enabling the research, enabling telling the stories and enabling the transparency to help us to level the playing field and understand, you know, what really how to define some of these things and how to best communicate and tell our story to the end consumer. And hey, one, one, go ahead. Go ahead. Can Travis. I speak for a sec? Yep. Hey, so one thing I wanted to tell you guys is, is, uh, we have real world data from what we found. I'm not a social media guy personally, uh, but our company is in order to, get, to reach out there. And what we found was it's not the millennials that are that are online paying attention to what we're doing. That's only about 20%. It's all Gen Ys and Gen Zs. We had 1.2 billion impressions on social media last year, and it was 80% Gen Y and Gen Z. The younger people that are glued to their phone 95% of the time are the ones that are driving what you're going to be growing in the future. Oh, absolutely. And that depends on your platform. You know, if you're on LinkedIn, you're touching a more professional base community. I have an Instagram account for South Bend, Bend Hemp, and it's all the Gen Y and Gen Zs. And while they're not directly buying my herd, they're directly impacting the market growth. That uh, You know, they're sharing the posts. They're, they're free employees, really, because they just keep spreading the word about hemp. And so being smart about the tools you use and really... The people that, you know, we continue having the younger generation, um, you know, he mentioned that in the opening remarks this morning, we want to take risks. And so maybe find that one person that believes in your regenerative practices or you, the vision that you have for your farm and get them on board because they're going to take risks with you in an educated way to grow your business. Yeah. The, uh, this age demographic issue is really important, and it's something we pay attention to from an investment standpoint. So if you go back on the Internet, Steve, jo most of the people who really drove the Internet, Steve Jobs, uh, all the guys that developed the Internet at MIT, Bob Metcalf, uh, Bill Gates, all were born around 1949. And these demographic changes, if you read the fourth turning, it's a good sort of explains this a little bit, but the, the thing you should think about is you're thinking about your farm, as you're thinking about technology, we pay a lot of attention to Gen Z because they're tech forward, they're tech enabled, they understand how to apply technology, they've seen people before them try to solve these problems, they're entrepreneurial in nature. When we look at diet, the most significant change of diet in the, in the, in the 50 year olds who are most at risk for diabetes has been influenced by Gen Z at home changing their diet. And the, if you go to a restaurant and ask uh, how many plant-based um, dinners have they sold, they're always oversold. And it's always 55-year-olds buying them. And when you ask those 55-year-olds, even ask yourself, how much have you been influenced by your young child, by your 20-something child? And the, the numbers are dramatic. And as you think about, I think an aim point has this data that if Farmers are more interested in investing in the next generation if the younger generation wants to be tech forward, which brings me to a point that we've got to focus on at iSelect, which is we want to find those 20-year-old uh, and even older, but, but that sort of next generation farmer coming in who's thinking about how to apply technology. And we've been thinking hard about trying to expose them to our flow of technology that we're seeing. We've looked at 3,200 deals in the last five years. If we start exposing them to what we're seeing, will they see opportunities to apply it in a way to close the loop on data, to close the loop on waste, and close the loop on regenerative farming, and apply the best understanding of how to apply technology, and then match that with their, with their parents who understand the practical challenges of how to grow. If you put those two together, you put a 55-year-old together with a Gen Z, 
they will accelerate technology adoption and come up with better answers faster than any other cohort of people we've seen in, in a generation. Yeah, I, I think. I, I have, I, I have, well, okay. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to end. We're about to wrap it up. I'll, uh, I'm going to give you guys the hack, how this all happened. Some of you may will say, oh man, that guy was just dumb lucky. Well, we're on the subject right here. If you want the hack. First hire, I first hire a graphics person, all right? You guys see all the crazy graphics in the reports all the years? I hire the graphics person. I pump it to the colleges for free. I let any college kid with an EDU have the report for free. I go to the youngest millennial base, all new innovative technology, all disruption, happens at the underserved spot in the world, underserved. I'll talk to you later. I mean, we talk until we'll we're blue in the face. You don't come in and start selling Lexuses. Honda comes in and sells scooters. And then they sell cheap, shitty cars. In the 1970s, they got about 50 miles a gallon. Then they busted everyone's ass in the Lexus and took over market share. You don't start there. You start at the underserved. And the underserved was the kids. And I knew for a fact that Pepsi, Coke, tries to spend every dollar they have on the kids because that's when you're at the most influential age. And I knew if the kids had this report for free, they'd take it home to dad. And they'd say, dad, look what I'm learning at school. Dad say, shit, where'd you get that from? You got it from here. And then that started to create this. And you know why we moved the conference up to this early in the year? because I had people say they wanted to bring their kids. What's the one common thread in this whole room? It ain't that you grow, you, you drive green, you drive red, you pioneer, you grow Benson Hill, your kids. You all give a shit about your kids. We all care about our kids. Leaving the farm to our next family. You gotta find the common thread. Find the common thread in your business, go to the underserved person, create an opportunity for them to get it at a reasonable low cost it's your social media team, and you look in that angle. And you have to figure out and look from a different perspective. You don't start and try to go to the high end of the continuum in the right side of the, the market. You can't work your way backstream. Start downstream. Start to the undisturbed. Do something for them. Give them something. Let them have it. Do what you're saying on social media. Do what you're doing on TikTok. Do what you're doing on all of your platforms. Give back to the kids. Let the kids then take that and give it, and make the decision to the people that have the money. Because what do I want to do and what's Andy and so on, you know, and all the people want to do, you want to try and help your kids a little bit. So you try and help them. And it's just a loop and it creates a loop. And you have to think like a business owner. You want to build your brand, how are you going to do it? How am I going to target it? Who's my target market? Who's my specific person? You better know it to a gnat's ass and you better have a plan. It just ain't going to happen. You, see, you might think Steve's up here like he's Forrest Gump. Well, bullshit, I'm not buying it. He's not. He has a plan. He's really good at it. It may sound like he's just winging it, but I know Steve. He's got it all thought out, mapped out. Yeah, yeah, huh? I'm not sitting down to play poker with Steve anytime soon, trust me. I'm not going to be the dummy in the room, so I, I'm just telling you. Guys, they're dead on. Mitchell, Melissa, I appreciate it. love the fact you guys are doing it. You're taking the steps that direction. Steve, Travis, all the producers. Then you flip the, just flip the page. Now you got Carter at the highest end. I mean, Carter's talking above everybody. Say he's super smart guy, one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life, Matt and Soren. I combine them for a reason. When you make that mesh, your brain filters something and it's sticky. You have people who are talking lower here. You have people higher here. There's a little bit of a mesh there. That's why the panels are set up like this. I'm letting you look behind the curtain. I'm telling you what's going on here. It, I've, I've thought it all through, and this is why we're having this success. You can do the same, though, with your very own business, and you can think it all through and think through the moving pieces. But this is it. You're hearing the same thing from the highest with Kelly, Carter, Matt, and Soren, corporate level. You're hearing the same from all of us that are like us in, in the room at, at, at our level. And that's what I think is important. And so 
You guys have all hit on the exact same thing, just in a little different way and a little different perspective, which is what I love. And it's like, I hope you all see and you can use that to, for your tools and your business and for your family, because that's what we're all doing it for. I mean, my whole goal when we set it out, I, I told you guys the whole line. I had a coach tell me one time, you can build the tallest building in town, right? He says, how can you build the tallest building in town? You got two ways. I can go around and destroy everyone else's building or I can go around and help everyone build their building. And then when it's time for me to build my building, look what happened. It's a pretty good plan. And I appreciate every one of you in the room. And I'm just saying, these guys are giving it their all. You guys are giving it your all. We just got to think a little bit different. And I, Carter, love you, bud. Appreciate you being on. Kelly, Trav, I'll talk to you guys. Let's break. We're going to come back. I got... Our next speaker's up, and hell, I won't rant any longer, and we'll have questions and talk to these folks. So, love you guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, mine's on my table. But, yeah, I'll shoot you a message. I'm just interested in what you guys are doing.